Please be seated. Please be seated, dear colleagues. We are going to start. Madam uh, Secretary General, Mr. Deputy Secretary General, Madam Secretary General of the Assembly, Despina, dear Despina, uh, let me specifically welcome you, since this is your first part session. Let's hope everything goes well, uh, but I'm sure it will, uh, and I would like to say to our colleagues that it is uh, specifically very enjoyable to work with Despina and her team, uh, because we do have a lot of work to do, and it, it goes in a very good fashion, I may say. So, members of the Assembly, uh, colleagues, ambassadors, for those who choose uh, to be with us, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to start with the following. Cherry Gillen, a great European and a most appreciated colleague, left us on April 5th. A tireless champion of democracy, Dame Cheryl, was a bright and remarkable member of the British delegation to the Parliament, the Assembly of the Council of Europe since 2013. She was also a member of the Bureau of the Parliament, Assembly and Vice Chairperson of the European Conservatives Group and Democratic Alliance and Chairperson of the Committee on Political Affairs and Democracy. A committed defender of democracy, rule of law and human rights, but also an inspirational woman for all of us, a compassionate and caring colleague and dear companion with a great sense of humor. Cheryl will be sorely missed by all of us. Um, I invite you all for a minute of silence to honor her memory. Thank you. Mesdames et Messieurs, mes chers collègues, permettez-moi de euh, commencer par euh, remercier toutes et tous qui sont ici présents avec nous dans l'hémicycle. C'est toujours bien de se voir en présentiel. Évidemment, je souhaite la bienvenue à toutes et tous qui nous ont rejoints à travers euh, leur petit ou grand écran. Euh, mais il est quand même... Euh, euh, très, 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 euh, si vous voulez, euh, c'est avec beaucoup de joie, quelque part, que, que je suis content qu'il y a plus de 100 collègues qui ont, euh, qui ont accepté de venir dans cette session, qui pour moi, euh, principalement, est en présentiel, parce que si tous les collègues avaient venu, euh, cher Despina, on n'était pas en hybride, mais bon, comme malheureusement, il y a quand même des collègues qui sont dans l'impossibilité de nous rejoindre, le, si vous voulez, la session en présentiel euh, automatiquement s'est convertie 
euh, en session hybride. Je voudrais profiter de l'occasion de remercier euh, les autorités françaises et son ambassadrice Marie Fontanelle pour tout le travail qu'ils ont fait. Vous l'avez vu euh, dehors. Euh, euh, on devient vraiment des experts à organiser euh, des sessions ici à Strasbourg de notre Parlement. Euh, C'est vraiment euh, avec beaucoup, beaucoup de plaisir que, que nous travaillons ensemble avec les autorités euh, françaises. Et évidemment, nous respectons pleinement les mesures sanitaires. Donc, j'espère que toutes et tous ont été dehors pour faire votre petit test. Et si jamais il y en a un ou une qui ne l'a pas fait, je vais vous envoyer dehors. Je vous le dis déjà, déjà, dès lors. Et deux, je vous demande quand même de respecter toutes les mesures sanitaires de distanciation. Et je sais bien que souvent, après une heure ou deux heures, c'est embêtant d'avoir ce masque sur le nez. Mais quand même, si j'en vois un ou une qui n'a pas le masque sur le nez, je, je vous avertirai. Et je vous demande vraiment de, de respecter toutes les mesures euh, sanitaires euh, qui ont été mises en place grâce aux autorités françaises et aussi grâce au bon travail de nos propres services et avec la coopération, évidemment, de la secrétaire générale et des collègues ambassadeurs. Maintenant, il y a, il y a bien une année que euh, nous vivons tous ensemble, tous et toutes ensemble, cette crise covid qui n'est pas facile à surmonter, mais nous, nous faisons de notre mieux pour le faire. Pour des fins de traduction, je, je vais continuer à mener la réunion, comme je vous l'ai dit déjà avant, en anglais. Comme ça, ce sera plus facile pour nos, nos traducteurs de me suivre. So, dear colleagues, um, just as an opening remark briefly, COVID has obviously affected uh, all of our citizens' daily lives. We hope that the vaccinations goes, goes fast, uh, swiftly, in order for us to be able to welcome even more of our colleagues in the hemicycle in the near future. But it also affects the daily lives of uh, the people, the citizens. Uh, we mourn the death, unfortunately, due to this crisis. And we do hope that the medical science evolves quickly in order to administer vaccines to all, not only all the citizens of our member states, but all citizens throughout the planet. Because as you all know, as long as not everyone is vaccinated, I mean, the problem will persist. But it also affected, obviously, um, other issues of daily life, such as fundamental freedoms. Uh, and sometimes in some of our member states and, and, and beyond, the abuse uh, of uh, not having fundamental freedoms It is an issue that the Secretary General has addressed um, on several occasions, we did too. Um, pandemic laws, um, specific laws, emergency laws. And we do see that not only where it is needed to restrict fundamental freedoms because of the sanitary situation, that we do see some abuse, alleged abuse, of these laws for other means than just sanitary purposes. But it also affects our work. I'm very glad that we have a number of colleagues uh, here now. But just to give you one example to the extent of which this affects our work, I don't know whether you realize this, but our, just as an example, our committee chairs and our committee vice chairs haven't had a single meeting with their colleagues, not even in a hybrid manner, since January last year. So that's 15 months that our committee chairs, our committee vice chairs, our members of committees were not able to see each other physically. And this is obviously extremely important. The same goes in part for our rapporteurs. And luckily, we try to get back on board, deciding that to a certain extent we do get back into the logic of observing elections. This is also why uh, in January already I told you we have to reboot uh, to a certain extent. Uh, taking a calculated risk, which we are doing today again, to go in hybrid mode. Now in April, uh, again, we do this. And as a matter of fact, we do make progress because today we had the first, again, physical visit of a head of state to President of Moldova. We have a full agenda, um, dear colleagues, uh, and we've got very important people who will address this assembly, allowing you to put questions uh, to them. We've got, uh, obviously, the President of Moldova, Madame Sandu, but we also have Chancellor Merkel. 
We've got President Sassoli, we've got Secretary General Gurria, we've got the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Rood, we've got our own Secretary General, we've got the Human Rights Commissioner. So, there's a lot of work that we have on our plate, and on top of that, we've got, uh, if accepted, of course, two urgent and two current affairs debates on very important issues. It comes to show that the work we are doing out of the presidency, amongst others, is to make this assembly as political, politically relevant as possible. And I think that we are, in part, succeeding uh, to that goal, be it under conditions that are not so easy. Now, physical contact is essential. We know that. Um, the people that we have here with us today will allow me and yourselves to contact amongst each other. Uh, as I told before, I mean, in order to convince colleagues or be convinced by colleagues, you just need to meet physically. It is not possible through a screen. Um, and it does affect the result of our work, however hard we are working. And another effect of this is that you see some kind of a trend of deviating, if I may say, um, from the essence of what our organization stands for. The fact that you cannot meet with colleagues has an effect that you turn to yourself and that in a certain number of countries, you start to have the national interests become more important than the shared values. I tend to say that this is not abnormal, but it should not become normal. And as a matter of fact, it should not even exist. And I know it is difficult through the screens, but still the physical absence of being getting together makes that this trend is visible. And if there's one big example of that one, it is the withdrawal of the Istanbul Convention, Madam Secretary General. I think that it is in part also because of this trend that we see that now national agendas tend to go over the international multilateral shared values, shared standards agenda that we stand for. And we even see that in this case, conventions, and in this specific case, it might be that this convention is used, abused, as a political tool for other means. And this is a shame. I hope it doesn't continue. And although we might understand the reason behind, but this is within the context of, let's say that we agree to disagree. I disagree. And I hope that this trend doesn't continue. And I, together, obviously, with all of you, I hope, and certainly with our Secretary General, will try to go against this trend. And as a matter of fact, in uh, in part with over 100 of our colleagues present here, I hope that we can go countercurrent uh, of this kind of trend and make sure that values do go over interests, obviously within a context, I have said it before, of equal standards. I will not stand for double standards. I only stand for equal standards and for values going over interests. Now, PACE, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, as we all know, is the political voice of the organization. We have to raise issues. We have to call the problems out. We have to make our opinion clear. And we can do so in a fierce way. Of course, within the boundaries of decency, if I may say so. But then at the same time, I had this reflection last night concerning this, that is it enough to raise the issues? And why am I saying this? Because there's a big difference between raising an issue and addressing an issue. That's a world of difference. If I make a comparison, it's a bit like talking about a country or talking with a country and its political responsibles from majority and opposition. It's a very different thing. And it gives rise, as far as I'm concerned, to quite a fundamental question which becomes very pressing also because of this situation of COVID not allowing us to be physically with each other. And the question somewhere or somehow would be the following. Should we as an assembly become part of the solution to the issues we raise? Or should we as an assembly stay at the stage of only raising the problem? It's a basic question. Should we be part of the solution or should we be part of the problem or stay? part of the problem. This is really fundamental. I, as president of the assembly, and I hope many of you, wish to be part of the solution after, obviously, having raised the issue in a very clear way 
having raised the problem. Now, parliamentary diplomacy, as far as I'm concerned, it should lead the way to becoming part of the solution, for that is what matters, dear colleagues, to the 830 million citizens in Europe that we have pledged to defend in terms of this one legal space of 47 member states, we have pledged to uphold, to defend and even expand their human rights, their fundamental freedoms in a context of rule of law and democracy. This is what we all pledge to. Not only our countries, but each and you individually is supposed to have pledged to that. And therefore, let me once again, which I stated over a year ago in my inaugural speech, let me quote Mr. Spark, our first president, 70 years ago. For he said, if I have to choose between a perfect and a better world, I will choose for the better world. Why? Because we can create this better world ourselves. If alone, we have the openness, the willingness, and above all, the courage to do so. So I stand for this quote. Let's all together try to make a better world. Let's all be part of the solution and not stay just on the side of raising the problem. Now, as you know, I'm a very optimistic guy. So I think uh, from an optimistic point of view that we can and that we should. Uh, for I think it is our duty, and just quoting someone else, Karl Popper, uh, most of you may know him, he said, optimism is a moral duty. I do believe that. Optimism is our moral duty. Thank you, and let's get to work. Dear colleagues, the first issue on our agenda, the first item on the agenda is the examination of credentials of new members. The names of the representatives and substitutes are in document 15264. If no credentials are challenged, the credentials will be ratified. Despina, is there any challenge? No? Okay, then these are ratified. I'll have to go through my papers because we are prepared for everything all the time, you know. Okay. Then we go to the election of Vice President of the Assembly. In this case, it is in respect of the Republic of Moldova. This is the next item uh, on our agenda. The nomination that I have received is uh, of Mr. Vlad Batrinkea. Is there a request to vote on this nomination? I do not see any. I see on the request list something here. That's Mr. That's Mr. Zingeris. Is there a request for the floor? In the M cycle, I don't see any. I see. I see Mr. Zengris who asks for the floor. Can you give the floor to Mr. Zengris, please? I don't think it's in that. Well, we'll see. Hello. Uh, dear Speaker, hello for everyone. Uh, Emmanuel, you've got the floor. Yes, thank you so much. Dear Speaker, uh, our request coming with some <laughs> humoristic technical delay and uh, of course, the topics are uh, changing, and I am supporting all topics just uh, uh, announced by you in the sense of un un uh, unanimous uh, voting. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, ch charging anyone uh, from the candidates and not uh, making uh, 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 the request to vote in the chamber. But uh, uh, I, I would like, uh, on the beginning, I raised the uh, question to make our remarks and our speeches. And I would like to uh, use that to say that everything done by you was uh, okay. Uh, but uh, in this case, we should enlarge our topics and current debate. Uh, if to, uh, having two debates, if we have more important topics, and on Friday we have free possibility, we should uh, change our rules and have at least three topics. Like, for example, Ukraine. Mr. Zinger is, uh, uh, thank yes. you. But I mean, you can come back to that when we treat the urgent and current affairs debate, please. You can ask yes. for the floor then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. And may I ask to all of our colleagues that we try to stay within the item on the agenda. 
because as you know, we've got an enormously charged agenda and uh, timing might be of the essence. So may I ask again whether there is a um, uh, demand for a vote on the Vice President of the Assembly in respect to the Republic of Moldova? I don't see any, therefore it is accepted. Then we've got changes in the membership of committees. This is our next business, to consider these changes proposed in the membership of committees. These are set out in Document Commissions 2021-04 and uh, Addendum 1. Are the proposed changes in the membership of the Assembly committees agreed to? I have to watch out because, it, strangely enough, in order to read, I have to take my glasses off, so, and then I don't see who <laughs> might ask for the floor in the hemicycle. No? Okay, so this is agreed to. Then we come to the proposal for urgent procedure and current affairs debates. So before we can examine the draft agenda, the Assembly needs to consider requests for debates on the urgent and current affairs procedures. The Bureau has received the following, a request for a debate on the urgent procedure on the arrest and detention of Alexei Navalny in January 2021 from all five political groups, a request for a debate on the urgent procedure on the functioning of democratic institutions in Turkey from all five political groups, a request for a current affairs debate on COVID passports or certificates, protection of fundamental rights and legal implications requested by the ALDE political group, a request for a current affairs debate on Armenian prisoners of war, other captives and displaced persons request by the EPPCD political group, a request for a current affairs debate on COVID-19 vaccination certificates, how to protect public health and human rights requested by the Social Affairs, Health and Sustainable Development Committee, and a request for a current affairs debate on Russian threat to the pursuit of peace in Europe requested by the Ukrainian delegation. Now, at its meeting on Friday uh, of the Bureau, the Bureau agreed to the two urgent procedure debates and to the first two applications for a current affairs debate. I remind that the Assembly can hold a maximum of two current affairs debates in the same part session. So, a lot of requests. First, we will consider the requests for urgent procedure debates, and then, once this is finished, we will consider the request for current affairs debate. So, now we get into request for debate on the urgent procedure. The first one is arrest and detention, uh, Alexei Navalny in January 2021. On Friday, the Bureau agreed to this request. Does the Assembly agree with the Bureau's recommendation? I see no request for the floor, so I consider this to be accepted. Done. I have to go to my pages. Then we come to the request for debate under urgent procedure of functioning of democratic institutions in Turkey. On Friday, the Bureau agreed to this. Oh. I do apologize, but I have to. I just skipped one page too many. I propose that the topic of the debate that we just agreed upon, the detention of the Mr. Navalny, um, would be referred to the Committee on Legal Affairs for report. Okay, no objection, thank you. Then we go to the request for debate on the urgent procedure concerning the function of democratic institutions in Turkey. On Friday, the Bureau agreed to this request. Does the Assembly agree with the Bureau's recommendation? I believe so, thank you. Then we have to see. Then I propose that the topic of this debate... Je ne vois pas. Okay. Yeah, Ahmed, I, didn't, I do apologize, but you're so far away, man. So, uh, but you're standing up, so you got the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, indeed, although I am always open to any dialogue, and your visit to my country will be a turning point on this. From my misdemeanor, I should uh, inform this August body that that many debate in my country, that frequent debate doesn't help anything. Indeed, it is sometimes backfiring. So that's why I urge the assembly to postpone this to another session because the issues here 
uh, cannot be dealt in one week, two weeks, one month. Some of them require systemic changes. And on judicial issues, we should wait for the decisions of the judiciary. Sometimes these debates cause inconsistency in the public opinion, for example, on Istanbul Convention. When representatives of the majority from those countries which still didn't ratify the convention for 10 years, when they criticize, it caused a lot of consistency and question mark. That's why I think it is not time, uh, it is not deserved now to de any debate on my country. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, who is the chair of the Turkish delegation in our assembly, who wishes to speak in favor. I see Tini Cox. Tini, you've got the floor. Thank you very much, sir, Mr. President. Yes, it would be better that we should not have to discuss the developments on democratic institutions in Turkey time and again, but the reality is that circumstances do ask for it. You would just pay your visit, working visit to Turkey to address these important issues with regard to the rule of law, pluralist democracy, uh, the, the respect for uh, verdicts of, of our court, and the Istanbul Convention. So I think that's the reason that five political groups do ask this assembly to have this urgent debate in this week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tini. Um, so we had someone against uh, Ahmed and someone in favor. Um, Ahmed, do you request a vote on the issue? Yes. OK. So uh, Mr. Yildiz requests a vote. I inform the assembly that the bureau was in favor. Um, and I also inform you, in order to overturn the decision uh, of the Bureau, you need a two-thirds majority. Okay, so members present uh, in the Assembly uh, should use the hemicycle voting system, which is in front of you, as you know. Members participating remotely should vote using the remote voting system. Those who are in favor of holding this urgent procedure debate should vote yes, in order for there not to be any misunderstanding. Those who are against holding such a debate should vote no. Are we ready, Despina, with our systems? Because this is the first vote we're going to have. OK. So the vote in the hammer cycle and the vote remote is now open. Please vote. Close. Please vote, specifically those of you who are remotely connected. Okay, vote is closed. Uh, Despina, can we have the results after they have been compiled? You know, we've got this intricate system of voting in situ and remotely. We've got a my screen, result compiling in progress. Okay. So we've got 87 members in favor, 32 um, against, and 13 extensions. Ext um, so basically, there's no two thirds to overturn the debate. Thank you very much. I propose that this topic of a debate we have just agreed on be referred to the Monitoring Committee for report. Is this OK? Thank you. Then we now come to the current affairs debate, uh, where we have um, an agreement of the Bureau or a proposal of the Bureau. We now come to the request for a current affairs debate on COVID passports or certificates, protection of fundamental rights and legal implications. At its meeting on Friday, the Bureau approved this request and therefore recommends to the Assembly that the matter be debated during this part session. Does the Assembly agree to this recommendation? Okay. It is accepted and the request for a current first debate is therefore approved. The debate will be opened by Damien Cotier. 
Okay, then we go to the second request, which is um, the request for a current affairs debate on Armenian prisoners of war, uh, other captives and displaced persons. At its meeting again on Friday, the Bureau approved this request and therefore recommends to the Assembly that the matter be debated during this part session as set out on the draft agenda as issued. Does the Assembly agree to this recommendation? Okay, I see some requests for the floor or not? Oh, okay, I see there. Okay, I see one, two, three colleagues asking for the floor. How does this go? Is this like one in favor, one against, or can anyone take the floor in the current affairs debate? I can only take one in favor and one against. So I will take Mr. Zadov, uh, who is, I think, asking for the floor remotely. Am I right there? Yes. Okay, so give the floor to Mr. Zadov, please. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for giving me the floor. Uh, and I want to express my gratitude to you for your excellent opening remarks, where you absolutely rightly mentioned that we should not only talk about the country, we should talk with country. And that's essential one. From this point of view, it seems to me that uh, these kind of topics, it's attempt to use parliamentary assembly in not so right direction. Azerbaijan is talking about the peace and Azerbaijan already doing its best for the peace. And any attempt to present the question in absolutely not so understandable way, uh, just exaggerate the situation, just uh, created more obstacles for peace. That's why, of course, as a head of the delegation, I'm against of this kind of current affairs debate. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Zedov. I recall our colleagues that the Bureau uh, is in favor of holding this current affairs debate. I take it that Mr. Zedov asks for a vote. So we will now vote on the Bureau's recommendation to hold the current affairs debate on Armenian prisoners of war, other captives and displaced persons. I remind the Assembly that the decision requires a simple majority. Members present in the chamber should use the hemicycle voting system. Members participating remotely should vote using the remote voting system. Just to be clear again, those who are in favor of holding the current affairs debate should vote yes. Those who oppose holding this current affairs debate should vote no. Is the vote open? The vote is open. Please vote. Vote is closed. Can we have the results, please? Compiling in progress. It's a bit like the Eurovision Song Festival, right? And the votes are? Voila. 93 colleagues have voted in favor, 21 have voted against, and 18 abstention. Therefore, the current affairs debate is accepted. The first speaker, I have been informed, would be Mr. Alain Milon. Thank you for this. Colleagues, let's now go to the uh, next item of business, which is the adoption of the uh, agenda for the second part of the 2021 Ordinary Session, Document 15241, Provision 2. The draft agenda submitted for the Assembly's approval was drawn up by the Bureau on March 18, 2021, and it was updated last Friday. I remind you that we have just to agree to hold two urgent affairs debate and two current affairs debate. It is proposed that the current affairs... I will come to you in a moment, please. I, I would appreciate not get cutting in the middle of when I'm trying to inform our colleagues. So I recall, I remind you that we have just agreed to hold two urgent affairs debate and two current affairs debate. It is proposed that the current affairs debate take place on Tuesday morning and Tuesday afternoon. 
and that the urgent procedure debates will take place on Thursday as set out in the draft agenda. I would also would like to draw your attention to the extension of the Tuesday afternoon sitting, which will now last, if I understand it well, Despina, from 2 to 6 in the afternoon. And finally, in view of the large number of registered speakers, and in order to allow as many of them as possible to speak, the Bureau asks the rapporteurs to limit their speaking time to seven minutes to present their report and three minutes to reply to the debate. Before accepting the agenda, I have a request for the floor. You have the floor. Merci. Merci, le Président. I'm very sorry. I tried to raise my hand, but it was not visible. I tried to follow the rules of procedure all the time. My point of order was concerned to uh, uh, application of Ukrainian delegation for one of the topics of the current debate, which uh, was called Russia threat to the pursuit of peace in Europe. We do not uh, intend to put it on vote. Uh, the Bureau has taken a decision. But I would like to take this opportunity for the Assembly to hear that currently the Russian troops, uh, which are numerously of 100,000 soldiers plus, are surrounding the borders of Ukraine. And uh, the ceasefire was broken. So it's not a threat only to Ukrainian territory, Ukrainian no, independence. I, I do it's apologize. a threat I do to apologize, uh, the Council to, of Europe I and the human rights. I do apologize to interrupt you, but in a point of order, we do not go into the substance. However, I think that Whatever you have to say is important. Abs absolutely, dear but Chair. I just wanted to no, take this, this opportunity to ask colleagues mm -hmm. to sign a statement instead of this well, debate. Thank with you all very due much. Respect, Merci, le Président. With all due respect, I mean, we're having a very charged uh, uh, session. I understand why you ask for the floor. But please stick to what we are used to do, and which is within the rules. When you ask the floor for a point of order, it has to be on a point of order. You will have ample occasions in other debates, maybe to, in the sideline, raise these issues, you and anyone else. But please refrain, dear colleagues, from abusing of point of order in order to have a political statement. Having said this, is there any remark as to the draft agenda? No? Then the agenda is agreed upon. And as I said, I mean, the COVID just is something that makes us a little bit more nervous. I understand that. So please settle down and let's have a continued good meeting. Now, we have the adoption of the minutes of proceedings of the Standing Committee. The minutes of the meeting of the Standing Committee in Strasbourg on March 19, 2021 has been distributed. This is uh, as per 2021 PV01. I mean, I'm just reading what's on my paper here. I don't really understand it, but OK. I invite the Assembly to take note of these minutes. Any remark? No? Good. Then we come to the next item on the agenda, uh, which is a debate on the progress report of the Bureau and Standing Committee, document 15263 and addendum 1 and 2, which will be presented by Mr. Alexander Pojcik. The debate must conclude by 12.30, because at 12.30 we will hold the ceremony on the Vaclav Havel Human Rights Prize. I hope that you will stay on board for this ceremony and will continue then this afternoon at 5 p.m., is that correct? After we hear from the President of the Republic of Moldova at 4. May I call Mr. Alexander Pojcik to present the progress report. Alex, I don't know whether you are in the house. You are. You have seven minutes to present your report and then we'll have a further three minutes to reply to the debate at the end. Alex, you have the floor. Merci, euh, cher président. Si vous me permettez, je resterai assis. J'ai déjà parlé dans une masque, c'est pas rigolo, mais euh, si je reste debout, ça peut se terminer mal. Monsieur le président, mes chers collègues, je suis très heureux de vous présenter le dernier rapport d'activité du bureau et de la commission permanente de notre Assemblée qui couvre la période de janvier à avril 2021. Je n'entrerai pas ici dans les détails de toutes les activités qui figurent dans le rapport. Je concentrerai mes propos sur les actions principales et les cinq priorités politiques. La première priorité a été naturellement l'impact de la pandémie de la Covid-19 sur le fonctionnement de la démocratie et sur celui de notre Assemblée. Le virus a changé nos habitudes et nos modes de vie et c'est là l'exercer à l'impact sur le fonctionnement de nos institutions démocratiques. 
Grâce au recours aux nouvelles technologies comme la visioconférence, les parlements ont su s'adapter et continuer à exercer leur rôle législatif et de contrôle. Cela vaut aussi pour notre Assemblée qui joue un rôle essentiel en Europe pour la défense de la, et la promotion de valeurs et de la démocratie, de l'état des droits et des libertés fondamentales. Je tiens à cet égard à rendre hommage à notre président et à notre secrétaire général et à tous et à tous et toutes les personnes de l'Assemblée parlementaire qui ont participé à l'organisation de cette session en format hybride. On ne confine pas la démocratie, mais on la fait vivre, y compris en pleine pandémie. La deuxième priorité a porté sur l'affaire Navalny. Je veux parler ici de l'empoisonnement de l'opposant politique Alexei Navalny, puis de son arrestation et de sa détention dans une colonie pénitentiaire, dans, ses, dans, les, dans des conditions inhumaines et des inquiétudes sur son état de santé. Nous devons nous montrer exigeants vis-à-vis -vis de la Russie pour lui rappeler ses engagements internationaux, notamment au titre de la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme, et exiger la libération immédiate et sans condition d'Alexei Navalny. Troisième priorité a concerné l'évolution préoccupante de la Turquie du président Recep Erdogan, notamment l'arrestation de plusieurs députés d'opposition et son retrait de la Convention d'Istanbul. Ce sujet a donné lieu à plusieurs rapports et débats au sein de notre Assemblée. Là aussi, en tant que parlementaire, membre de l'Assemblée par, euh, parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe, nous devons appeler les autorités d'Ankara à respecter les conventions internationales et les valeurs des démocraties, de l'état des droits et des droits de l'homme. La quatrième priorité a porté sur la situation en Biélorussie et des et la répression des autorités à la suite des manifestations des citoyens contestant l'élection du président Wukashenko dans les conditions douteuses. Nous appelons les autorités biélorusses à la libération, libération immédiate des milliers de personnes arrêtées à la suite de ces manifestations et à engager un véritable dialogue avec l'opposition. La cinquième et dernière priorité concerne la situation des prisonniers arméniens à la suite du conflit du Haut-Karabakh. Le 1er février dernier, le bureau de notre Assemblée a été, a été saisi par un courrier du président de la Commission juridique et des droits de l'homme sur la base d'un rapport au sujet du manque de coopération des autorités d'Azerbaïdjan au sujet de la situation des prisonniers politiques en Azerbaïdjan. Je pourrais évoquer aussi de nombreuses autres activités menées par le bureau et la commission permanente, notamment les missions d'observation électorale menées en Bulgarie et celles prévues en Albanie et Palestine. Mais je ne vais pas entrer trop dans les détails. Vous trouverez le récapitulatif complet dans le rapport écrit. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. Thank you, Mr. Rapporteur. To start a debate, uh, I've got my list in front of me. Uh, I will first call on uh, Petra Bayer, spot 74. You know, last time I didn't see you were here, so I again apologize for that. Again. Petra, um, the floor thank for you minutes. very much. I would like to tackle three issues. Uh, starting with the Istanbul Convention, uh, Alexander already mentioned it, which is really from great concern, as I consider that at the moment there takes place a kind of proxy war um, shaped by mere ideology and, and intentional misunderstanding of the term gender. And let me clarify and demystify this concept of gender, and to do that, allow me to quote the famous and landmark philosopher David Bowie, quote, gender is between your ears, not between your legs. 
the withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention, and Turkey already had done that, uh, unlawful in, in, in my understanding. It will get in, into effect in, by June, and Poland is debating about it uh, currently um, in, the, in the parliament. Um, this has for sure only one single result, which is to weaken the position of women which are victims of gender-based violence or of domestic violence. And that, that, that is not what we, that any country uh, must have an interest to get out at the end. So please, I really ask you to rethink these uh, decisions which have been already taken or which are in process to be taken. And I also want to encourage all those countries who have already signed the convention also to ratify it, and those who haven't signed it so far, please also to sign it. The second issue I would like to tackle is um, the pace representation in different institutions. We had a, a document on that in um, several bureau meetings, and the very first draft of the list had a ridiculous low number of women. And I'm really very happy that we agreed to um, uh, put, the, put the list back to all the committees, that all the committees rethought about the nomination of their representatives, and now it is much better indeed, but we still will not win a prize with this list, to be honest. And that comes, that brings me to my, th my first, third and last point. Um, I have to hope that in the course of this year, we will change the rules of procedure concerning gender representation, both in the assembly and in relating institutions, in a way that the rules will be unambitious and uh, assist us that our assembly mirrors the, the um, composition of our constituencies. And Nick Coltris is the rapporteur in the Committee of Rules of Procedure. I wish her um, much energy for this important work, which is not more or less than the fundament of a balanced policy representing diverse experiences, knowledge and needs we have, our constituents have, and I think that's a policy we really should urge for. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. A second on the list, and probably we will be able to have two more, including Andreas, because we have to start sharp at 12.30 with the Vaclav Havel Prize ceremony. Uh, but uh, please, know that, please note that after the President of Moldova, we will continue this debate at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So I now give the floor for three minutes to Andreas Nick, who is at spot 393, I've been told. Andreas, you have the floor. Herr Präsident, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, lassen Sie mich zu Beginn noch einmal an die traurige Nachricht erinnern, dass Dame Cheryl Gillen, die Vorsitzende des Politischen Ausschusses, an Ostern tragisch verstorben ist. Ich darf als erster stellvertretender Vorsitzender dieses Ausschusses besonders auch im Namen der Kollegen noch einmal an Sie erinnern. Ich hatte die Ehre, seit Anfang letzten Jahres dort sehr intensiv mit ihr zusammenzuarbeiten und während ihrer Erkrankung auch vielfach ihren Platz einzunehmen. Niemand hätte, glaube ich, von uns geahnt, dass das ein Abschied für immer wird. Ich darf daran anknüpfen, wir haben unter schwierigen Bedingungen der Covid-Pandemie im Januar erstmals wieder hybrid hier getagt. Wir haben die intensive Arbeit in unseren Ausschüssen auch in den letzten Monaten weitergeführt und wir tun das auch jetzt. Und ich glaube, es ist eine zentrale Frage, nicht nur für uns hier im Europarat, sondern auch für alle unsere Mitgliedstaaten, dass wir demonstrieren, dass freiheitliche Demokratien, dass Rechtsstaaten, die Menschenrechte achten, auch in der Lage sind, unter den Herausforderungen einer Pandemie ihre Bürgerinnen und Bürger besser zu schützen als andere und die Rechte und elementaren Grundfreiheiten zu bewahren, auch in schwierigen Abwägungsprozessen. Und wir erleben ja auch auf der Tagesordnung für diese Sitzung wieder, dass Fragen der Wahrung der Urteile, der Einhaltung der Urteile des Europäischen Gerichtshofs für Menschenrechte ganz zentral unsere politische Debatte bestimmen. Wir haben ja gerade für Donnerstag zwei Debatten im Hinblick auf wichtige Mitgliedstaaten, die Russische Föderation und die Türkei, an dieser Stelle noch mal angesetzt. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, wir werden nicht alles hier in dieser Versammlung lösen können, aber der, die Frage der Einhaltung von Urteilen des Menschenrechts ist der Kern der Verpflichtungen für die Mitgliedstaaten im Europarat. Und darauf müssen wir achten. Und wir müssen, das sage ein zweites, 
weil wir ja auch über Richterwahlen hier berichtet bekommen haben. Wir müssen auch die Integrität des Europäischen Gerichtshofs und der Richterwahlen sorgsam achten. Und deshalb ist es unverzichtbar, dass auch die Vorauswahl für die Vorschläge, die uns gemacht werden, aus den Mitgliedstaaten prozedural den notwendigen Anforderungen, die notwendigen Anforderungen erfüllt. Lassen Sie mich zum Schluss auch als Leiter der deutschen Delegation noch einmal sagen, wir sind natürlich ein bisschen traurig, dass die deutsche Präsidentschaft etwas erschwert wird, auch von den Bedingungen der Pandemie. Wir sind, glaube ich, trotzdem hinsichtlich der politischen Schwerpunkte froh und dankbar, dass wir gerade, was die Einhaltung der Urteile angeht, aber auch andere Fragen, einige Akzente haben setzen können. Morgen wird die Bundeskanzlerin Angela Merkel zu uns sprechen. Es ist auch der Jahrestag des, der 70-jährigen Mitgliedschaft Deutschlands im Europarat. Immer wieder ein Datum, das für uns in Deutschland besonderer Anlass zur Freude und Dankbarkeit ist. Der Europarat war die erste Institution, die mein Land nach 1945 wieder in die internationale Gemeinschaft aufgenommen hat. Ich darf Sie sehr herzlich auch einladen, auch auf Bitten des deutschen Botschafters. Wir haben eine Ausstellung in der Lobby über 70 Jahre deutsche Mitgliedschaft und würde mich freuen, wenn Sie die ein bisschen zur Kenntnis nehmen könnten in diesen Tagen. Ganz herzlichen Dank. Danke Ihnen, Andreas. On a un court temps pour un intervenant qui est dans la chambre, c'est le collègue Jacques Maire. Jacques, vous avez la parole trois minutes et après on enchaîne directement avec la cérémonie. Les collègues par après pourront continuer à partir de 17h l'après-midi pour continuer le débat sur ce rapport. Jacques, vous avez la parole. Micro. Euh, ravi d'être, euh, d'avoir l'occasion de conclure cette, cette matinée sur ce sujet. Euh, je crois que ce qui est très important, effectivement, euh, dans ce qu'a énoncé euh, euh, notre, notre collègue euh, Alexander Pocek, c'est effectivement ces cinq axes importants. Et de ce point de vue, ce qui n'a pas été dit dans le rapport, mais ce que je voudrais souligner, c'est l'importance de vos déplacements à la fois euh, à Moscou et à Ankara. Euh, vous l'avez fait avec l'accord de tous les groupes. Vous l'avez fait justement... Et je reprends ce qu'a dit tout à l'heure notre collègue Seidoff, pas uniquement pour parler de ces pays, mais pour parler avec ces pays. Et effectivement, il ne s'agit pas de négocier nos principes, il ne s'agit pas de négocier nos valeurs et l'application de la, des décisions de la Cour européenne. Il s'agit de voir avec chacun d'entre eux comment est-ce qu'on peut avancer concrètement. Et c'est clair qu'avec le Covid, les relations humaines étant absolument impossibles, les murs ne peuvent que s'élever quand on ne parle pas. J'espère réellement qu'il euh, sera possible de faire la même démarche avec la Pologne, avec laquelle aussi nous avons des difficultés, comme nous l'avons fait très récemment avec, euh, avec ces deux autres pays. Je voulais simplement aussi indiquer de façon très rapide que euh, parmi les sujets très importants qui ont été évoqués, la Belarus euh, nous pose effectivement une difficulté particulière. Il est très important là aussi que ce dialogue puisse avoir lieu. Ils ne sont pas membres, c'est difficile. C'est pour ça que nous appelons vraiment à ce que notre collègue rapporteur sur le sujet, M. Kimo Kilyunen, puisse réellement aussi aller en Belarus pour parler de ce pays, mais pour parler avec ce pays. Je voudrais dire deux mots aussi également concernant l'annonce du retrait de la Turquie de la Convention d'Istanbul. C'était d'autant plus malheureux et douloureux que ça a été fait pratiquement le jour de notre dernier débat d'actualité. C'était perçu franchement pour nous comme une véritable provocation. Et je pense que votre mission, là encore, elle permettra, j'en suis sûr, d'éviter à la Turquie que des mesures extrêmement fortes, voire définitives, soient prises à son encontre. Je pense que c'est d'un intérêt particulier des Turcs, du gouvernement, mais aussi de la population, des hommes et des femmes turcs, que de faire en sorte que ces garanties leur soient tout à fait consolidées. Et puis, euh, pour terminer, je voudrais vous dire mon inquiétude concernant euh, les regains des tensions à la frontière entre la Russie et l'Ukraine. Nous n'avons pas effectivement eu le temps d'avoir euh, la possibilité d'un débat d'actualité sur le sujet. C'est né néanmoins un sujet de préoccupation très important qui ne fait que croître jour après jour. Et de ce point de vue, effectivement, nous appelons à ce qu'une déclaration du plus grand nombre soit signée par les uns et par les autres. Et j'en terminerai naturellement pour évoquer le sujet de la semaine qui est la situation d'Alexei Navalny qui est pour nous une situation absolument inacceptable sa, sa situation sanitaire se dégrade jour après jour je suis sûr que ce sujet sera regardé en détail pendant notre session mais il me semblait important de le mentionner à nouveau ici je vous remercie euh, Merci Jacques Voilà Merci beaucoup Jacques. Nous entamons maintenant euh, nos travaux concernant 
la cérémonie euh, du prix Vaclav Havel, j'ai vu qu'il y a une demande point of order. We will take that at the start of the afternoon because we really have to stick to the timing for this very important prize. So after the president of Moldova, we will take this point of order on board. So colleagues, I declare open the award ceremony of the Vaclav Havel Human Rights Prize. Before inviting you to watch a short video on the prize, I should like to welcome our three shortlisted nominees. We are living through unusual times, and due to the ongoing crisis, this is going to be the first, and we sincerely hope the only time this ceremony takes place online. However, I'm very happy that the nominees can join us remotely and connect with those of us in Strasbourg and fellow colleagues, parliamentarians in the 47 member states who have opted to attend remotely. For us to be able to see the nominees, I will invite them now to push the button request to speak so that they can appear on the screen. Please request for the floor, the spina, if you can see how we can do this. We have, voila, one, two. Please request for the floor. Okay, let's hope that it all works. Madame Lesange, oops, voila. So now we have still a third one that we need to welcome. Where are the third one? So we're trying to get this connection done because this time we're like quite far away in some instances in order to get everyone on board. Can I ask to the Drugba ordinance to refresh and ask for the floor again? Because apparently there's a hiccup here. So, dear Drugba nuns, if you can refresh and request the floor again. Seems to be the case. Voila. They're coming. Voila. Welcome to all of you. And obviously, we have the sister of one of the nominees. Um, very glad to have you all on board which allows me now to invite all of us present here and remotely, also as our three nominees, to watch the video. Please start the video. The 10th of May, 1990. The President of the Czech and Slovak Federal Republic entered the Assembly Chamber of the Council of Europe. It was an emotional parliamentary assembly that welcomed the former political dissident, the figurehead of the Velvet Revolution, who in 1989 brought an end to the communist regime. In his welcoming address, the Assembly President paid tribute to the courage of one of the key figures of the opposition in the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. And you, Mr. President, are a symbol of the victory of freedom over totalitarianism. In his speech, the philosopher president, an atypical politician, spoke of his years of opposition and dreams took the place of hope. Everything seems to point to the fact that we should be not be afraid of dreaming of, of what seems impossible if we want something impossible to become a fact and a reality. Without dreaming of a better Europe, we shall never be able to build it. Following the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, which marked the end of the liberalization process of the Prague Spring, Václav Havel remained faithful to his convictions. As chairperson of the Circle of Independent Writers, his commitment led to the banning of his plays. The international community quickly became aware of this dissident. In 1977, Václav Havel co-founded Charter 77, an organization defending human rights in Czechoslovakia. 
Because of his activities, he was imprisoned on three occasions for almost five years. In 1989, the crowd spontaneously placed Václav Havel at the head of the Civic Forum, an association uniting opposition movements. He became a key figure in the Velvet Revolution. Almost a quarter of a century later, in March 2013, the prize was launched in Prague to honour what Václav Havel was and what he did. Since then, the prize is awarded each year by the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly in partnership with the Václav Havel Library and the Charter 77 Foundation to reward outstanding civil society action in the defence of human rights. For the eighth edition of the prize, the three candidates shortlisted are Lujain al Hatloul a prominent women's rights activist known for defying the ban on women driving in Saudi Arabia and for opposing the Saudi male guardianship system. The Nuns of the Drukpa Order, a group of young Buddhist nuns promoting gender equality, environmental sustainability and intercultural tolerance in their home villages in the Himalayas. They are known for their delivery of supplies after an earthquake struck Kathmandu in 2015. And Julien Lusenge, a Congolese human rights activist who has been documenting sexual abuse and acts of violence against women in Congo. She was instrumental in obtaining convictions of perpetrators who enlisted child soldiers and collected evidence of sexual slavery. In 1990, Mr. Havel spoke in Strasbourg of the immense strength embodied by the ideals of the Council of Europe. Referring to the organization's emblem, he said that for him, the 12 stars did not express the idea that the Council of Europe would succeed in building a heaven on earth, as there would never be a heaven on earth. But, in my opinion, these 12 stars are a reminder that the world can become a better place if we have the courage to raise our eyes to the stars. And I thank The Václav Havel Human Rights Prize pays tribute to this distinguished European. And it also pays tribute to all those who, through their determined and tireless work, bring us closer to the ideal of a better world. Quite impressive video. Dear colleagues, dear uh, nominees, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the eighth edition of the award ceremony of the Vaclav Havel Human Rights Prize. I would like to thank our partners, the Vaclav Havel Library and the Charter 77 Foundation for their cooperation and their incredible work and commitment to preserve the legacy and the values embodied by Mr. Havel, justice and human rights his courage to fight for them even in the most adverse times when standing up for what is right came with a heavy price to personal safety and well-being. I would also like to thank the members of the selection panel whose work is underpinned by passion, commitment and conviction. They went through each and every single nomination for very inspiring organizations and individuals that are determined to fight for the enjoyment of fundamental human rights and freedoms by each and every one of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has just entered its second year, leaving behind a heavy toll on human lives and the social, economic and cultural lives of our societies, and laying ahead a very uncertain future imbued with daunting challenges. We all have suffered and continue to face formidable challenges in getting about our daily life, getting about our daily life and businesses. I don't, the mic has gone. Can we, yep, here we go again. 
As I said, dear colleagues, we all have suffered and continue to face formidable challenges in getting about our daily life and business. But it is women across the world that are bearing most of the heavy burden of COVID-19. And that is not only in terms of job losses or being in the front lines where we fight the battles against COVID, the health services carrying the heavy burden of caring for children, the elderly, the family, all while keeping up with professional commitments. And for the millions of people across the globe who live in conflict zones and refugee camps, the situation is even more despairing. The impact of COVID-19 has hit harder women and has further exposed them to the dangers of violence, sexual exploitation and abuse. We can say without doubt that this crisis has further exacerbated persistent discrimination against women and has seen an alarming raise in acts of violence against women all over the world. I therefore see the nomination of Madame Lusange, Mrs. Alat Lul, and the nuns of the Drogba Order a fitting tribute to women's struggle against persistent discrimination and the right to enjoy a life free of, from violence. Vaclav Havel continues to inspire us to dream big. As he said, we should not be afraid of dreaming of what seems impossible if we want something impossible to become a fact of reality. He said in this chamber, and you heard it, he said, the world will become a better place if we have the courage to raise our eyes to the stars. And our nominees have the courage, they have the passion, they have the energy and the determination to dream big and fight for their dreams for a better and equal world. One where women are treated with dignity and respect, where they are given the same chances as regards to education and employment, the same opportunities to contribute to society, a society in which they can thrive and prosper, free from prejudice, misogyny, stereotypes and violence in all its many forms, physical violence, sexual violence, including rape and other sexual violence, female genital mutilation, forced marriage, forced pregnancy, forced abortion, or forced sterilization, or psychological and economic violence. With this prize, we honor their contribution to equality and justice, to solidarity, to upholding and strengthening human rights and women's rights. Human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights. That's a quote from former Secretary of State Clinton. Ladies and gentlemen, hard-earned rights are under threat, including in the Council of Europe member states. Efforts to undermine and weaken the protection system against violence against women granted by the Council of Europe legal standards, amongst others, and in particular, through the Istanbul Convention on Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, are worrying developments and call for leadership, they call for political courage, and firm action to uphold women's human rights. As shown by our shortlisted nominees, who I have to, the pleasure to present in alphabetical order, Ms. Lu Jain al Hatlutl, Saudi Arabia, the nuns of the Drukpa Order, Kung Fu Nuns, and Madame Julien Lusage, Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, choosing was not an easy job for they in my humble opinion, all deserve this recognition. The shortlisted nominees have shown courage and determination. They are an inspiration for all of us and a shining example for all the women and girls out there. So, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to announce to whom the prize is awarded. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vaclav Havel Human Rights Prize 2020 is awarded to Lujain Al Hatlul. But I would not want to do this. without showing the other ones. May I give the floor to 
the sister, if I get it right, of Madame Al Hadloul. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I just want to say that I deeply respect um, the current two nuns and um, Julian Lassange's uh, work. And now I will go um, with my speech. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Lina, and I'm speaking today on behalf of my whole family. Uh, as Lujane cannot be present to thank you herself. Um, Lujane cannot be present because although she has been released from prison, she's still silenced inside of the country. My sister Lujane spent a thousand and one days in prison. Her crime? Fighting for women's rights in Saudi Arabia. Lujane sacrificed herself to fight for a better life for Saudi women. She campaigned for our right to drive, to protect abused women, and to end the male guardianship system. Because of her activism, Lujane was kidnapped, deprived of finishing her studies, illegally imprisoned, brutally tortured, put in solitary confinement for months, and now sentenced as a terrorist. For years now, the Saudi regime has been trying to tarnish her image, to erase any support, and to make her forgotten. But the more time passes, the more Lujain proves to the world how incredibly brave, resilient, and attached to her values she is. She has now become a symbol of human rights defenders in Saudi Arabia, a symbol because there are thousands of detainees going through what she has been through. But silence has become the norm in our country, a police state that will even put families of detainees under a travel ban and force them into silence. Thankfully, some of us are out of the country and free to speak, free to become Lujain's silence voice. But our voice alone is not enough the world needs to recognize her sacrifices and to know who Lujain is. We would therefore like to thank the Vaclav Havel Awards Committee for choosing Lujain this year. International support is the only way we can expose injustices and protect the victims. We are truly honored by your support. Thank you for giving us strength to continue the fight. Thank you. Thank you very much for these words and above all for the courage of your sister and her commitment in defending the cause of human rights and women's rights. So thank you very much for having delivered these kind words, important words on behalf of your sister, Lou Jane. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. Thank you for having joined. Dear colleagues, now I conclude the ceremony. I was very happy to have all of the three of you uh, on screen. Um, congratulations, obviously, to uh, Lou Jane, who has been awarded the Vaclav Havel Prize. But as I said in the beginning, you all deserve it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes our ceremony. We will reconvene at 4 o'clock uh, with the president of Moldova. And really, I hope to see all of you in situ after COVID, be it in Saudi Arabia, in Congo, or with the Kung Fu Nans. Uh, I would be very, very glad to be able to meet you in person. Thank you very much for being here, and thank you for all the work you're doing.